All right, we're looking at a habitat that is shaded, covered by trees. Looking up, we can see pines, uh, a little bit of oak, a little bit farther in the distance. Uh, this is sort of a hilltop habitat, and it's adjacent to another area that I'll show you, a big sandy opening here. So kind of a rare habitat, and we're on the edge of that. So getting in closer, I'll show you some of the plants in here. So I'm going to focus just on the identifiable plants. Uh, this is the end of May right now, and we're a little bit early for a lot of the plants in this area. Uh, but I'll show you some that we have in flower or otherwise identifiable. Uh, there's one that you can see that's fairly abundant in here is a fern. And this is kind of an exceptional fern. It's a really upright, uh, broad spreading fern. So fern uh, leaves are these fronds. And uh, again, with ferns, what you see coming out of the ground is only one leaf. So the equivalent of a leaf here coming out of the ground. I'll go ahead and sacrifice this one. So this whole thing counts as one leaf. The stem of a fern, at least in our region, is the rhizome, and that's underground, protecting it from the winter. Uh, we can identify our ferns. One thing that usually jumps out about ferns is that they're highly divided in the leaves. So this one, we've got a central axis uh, petiole, or uh, rachis is what they use for the term for the central axis. And it's so big, i got to kind of hold it at a distance here. And we can see that it branches once from the center, uh, again from the center, and then a few smaller divisions as we get towards the apex of this. So that makes it pinnately compound. But wait, there's more. So another thing we typically find in ferns, uh, this is the leaflet, the uh, side branch of that leaf. And it's also fully compound. So this leaflet here is a secondary leaflet also divided all the way down to the midrib and then uh, this third order of branching not quite fully divided and that's something in ferns we use this term pinnatifid uh, so this is a plant that is uh, once pinnate twice pinnate and then the third order of division is pinnatifid so we could call that uh, the technical term for this kind of arrangement is bipinnate pinnatifid Yes, that whole combination of words describes the leaf of the fern I'm holding here. Uh, the reproductive structures are on here, but not showing themselves very readily. So I'll see how much I can get in focus here. Uh, the spores are produced in these rolled up portions at the bottom, the underside of the leaflets. So if I had a smaller device to look in there, we could peel that back and see the spores being produced. Uh, we're also pretty early season, so those aren't really ready to go yet. Another plant we have flowering in this area, uh, I don't see very many of them, so I would call these maybe uh, rare. There's a handful of them right here. These might be connected underground or uh, simply related to a parent plant that was growing here earlier. Uh, this is a plant with a stem that has single leaves branching off along it. And those leaves are sessile, so no petiole attached to them. And then a very nice example of uh, parallel venation. So these leaf veins, here's the underside, the abaxial surface. Uh, those leaf veins uh, split from each other, but then connect again towards the tip, running parallel for most of the length. Uh, overall shape here, I would call that elliptic. Uh, tapering nicely to an acute tip. And a little bit at the base of the leaf, what you call like a clasping leaf base. The blade expands a little bit around the uh, stem there. So the parallel venation might get us thinking monocot. And sure enough, that is the case here. And I'm going to take one of the flowers, and the flower will also remind us uh, how much of a monocot we are here. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six perianth parts and uh, looking underneath there's nothing else under there so this would be uh, tepals so neither fully sepals or petals these are tepals six of them uh, ovary is in there so single pistil um, 
I don't see the stamens. I see a little bit of uh, maybe evidence of where the stamens used to be in there. There's a little plant closer to the ground here. Uh, I don't see too many of them. I happen to know this is a weedy species, so I don't mind taking it apart. I'll reach in and get that down to the base. Uh, this is our plant here, one stem of that plant. And you can see we've got opposite leaves along the stem. Uh, the venation on the leaves, not really something you can make out get you a larger one here so not easy to see there's that central midrib a uh, couple of faint veins next to it running kind of parallel uh, there probably are some hidden veins that we just aren't seeing very well in there so venation is not something you'd probably find in a description of this plant uh, if you look i think you can tell that it's pretty hairy so we have hairs on the leaves hairs along the stem uh, leaves hairy on both surfaces, so underneath or abaxial here, upper surface, adaxial, all hairy, uh, opposite all along, opposite simple sessile leaves with a shape that's elliptic. And then uh, heading up towards the apex of the stem here, we've got uh, kind of some early season flowers happening here. So I uh, happen to pick one that doesn't have a flower showing super well. Uh, the collection of flowers is one pointing straight up and one heading off to the left and then some buds of flowers to come. So this is a plant that's uh, gearing up to do quite a bit of flowering, but we're just too early in the season. Uh, here we are in late May, early June. Uh, here's one with the flower on it. So flower we can see has uh, separate sepals. Uh, the petals are separate, a little bit hard to tell on the video probably. And then... Uh, we have both pistil and stamens in there. And the petals, this belongs to a group of plants that the petals tend to be uh, split like this. So sort of cut at the tip, sometimes very deeply, sometimes shallowly. Uh, but this feature is one, so it's technically a separate petal. Uh, this is one petal and uh, split up into the two big lobes toward the tip. We have a tree here that's kind of interesting from a uh, modern history kind of standpoint. This is one of our ash trees and ashes are really beset these days by an invasive beetle called the emerald ash borer. So this is the uh, ash toward the base. I'm gonna show you the top first. So the center of the image is heading up this ash tree. You can see it's pretty well dead up there. The emerald ash borer larvae are the problem, and uh, ash borer, as you might guess, means that they dig into the trunk of these trees. They eat the living part of the trunk, and that prevents water and sugar movement. Uh, it basically kills the tree over time. And uh, those, they're very effective. So I'm going to go ahead and peel this out. Here's the bark, and we can see some evidence of the beetles inside. Uh, these little windy paths are the paths they carved out. Uh, there's a lot of debris in there. When you see evidence of insect damage, you also find lots of insect poop, typically, or uh, frass, if you want to get more technical. So inside of this tree, uh, we can see that it's dead, really, from the ground up. But here's really the reason why it's dead, is that somebody ate all of its juicy living cells in there. So what's going on with the branches down near the base? Well, this is the uh, kind of recovery effort by the plant. So. Uh, the roots are not particularly attacked. They're going to be intact um, and able to support some new growth. And so this plant is basically regrowing from the roots. So there's a big bush of uh, new shoots coming up from the base of this plant. Uh, unfortunately, as they get established, they'll also be attractive to the ash borer. Uh, ash trees are pretty easy to identify. They have compound leaves that are opposite. So here we have just a little bit staggered here's maybe a all right we're gonna go with this one so they're uh, opposite leaves but they are just a little bit staggered i would in another plant call that uh, sub opposite so i'm kind of expecting an opposite leaf plant so i'm gonna go ahead and call it that uh, compound leaves so if you look at the base of those leaves you can see the uh, axillary bud that's one way that we can tell that this is a compound leaf and not a side shoot uh, another way is that all of these 
leaves are very similar. So the compound leaf to the left has five leaflets, the one to the right, uh, very much like the other one with seven leaflets. I mean, shoot. <laughs> uh, well, five or seven, let's say. But you can see basically the, the overall pattern of those leaves is about the same. Uh, so that makes this, makes that. <clears throat> one leaf uh, fully divided down to the midrib for all those leaflets. Leaflets with pinnate venation. Uh, this would be pinnately compound. And uh, a little bit of toothing on there as well. All right, so we're heading out into the habitat here, which is much more open. Uh, no real trees to speak of. The direction I'm facing is uh, lots of leftover grasses from last year. Uh, a lot of stuff hasn't grown up yet this year. And then heading over, we get into a bit of a shrub area, so kind of a scrubby shrubland. Uh, the green bits of the shrubs there, those are uh, juvenile oak trees, so quite a few of oaks in there. And uh, then heading back, there's been a little bit of management in here, so there was uh, some evidence of burning, some fire relatively recently. So some of these shrub bits that we see uh, could well be dead from the fire. So this is a management to uh, kind of reclaim a little bit the open area. Some of our grass, uh, sorry, our shrub species don't do quite as well uh, under fire. So getting rid of them by burning is a good way to restore uh, how things maybe used to be a little bit more. If we look down at the soil, uh, we can just kind of see, I guess maybe with some experience, this uh, is not quite as full of plants as you might expect for a place that's a little more, uh, say, nutrient rich or easy to grow for these plants. Uh, there's some little tufts of these, a little bit more like orange colored mosses and uh, lots of just open ground. And if we get in just a little bit underneath that, we can see the soil is uh, really gravelly, grainy. So kind of a fine grain. Uh, not super good at holding on to nutrients or moisture, and so the plants that are growing here would have to be uh, adapted to deal with that. So one of our plants uh, has these lovely purple flowers on there. Uh, not much to it. This is a single individual. So uh, you can see the root system not super well developed. Uh, linear leaves, I would say. So linear leaves coming off along the stem. Uh, I've seen other instances of this same species in this habitat uh, with more branched leaves, so compound leaves, but these happen to be just linear leaves. Uh, you would call these ascending, so the leaves are really uh, pushing up against the stem, they're heading in the same direction. Uh, not typically common, we typically think of leaves as spreading out to capture more sunlight. These are plants in an area that gets a lot of sunlight, so they might actually be at risk of getting too much. So they've got these leaves that are uh, not particularly large, not particularly uh, aggressive at getting their sunlight. So moving up the stem, we got these uh, leaves are alternate. It looks alternate for us here. Heading up uh, into the inflorescence. So this is a, a portion right here. This leaf is getting really tiny, smaller, and these actually look like we might be uh, developing some flower buds. I'm not sure what's going on in this region, but kind of a transitional zone between leaves and flowers. And then up here, we've got our first flower. Uh, looking at the whole inflorescence to this point, the lower parts used to be flowers and they're already going on to fruits. So the lowest one is a fruit here. The highest set are flowers and flower buds. And so you can see the progression of time in this plant. Uh, as we're moving along. So this would be an older plant, uh, older flower that has already flowered, been fertilized and producing fruit now, um, all the way up to the top of buds not yet turned into flowers. So this would be an indeterminate inflorescence qualifying as a raceme, so one flower at a time on a pedicel or stalk. Uh, the fruit you can see is uh, resulting from a superior ovary, so the uh, sepals are still attached, and they're attaching to the base of this fruit. The fruit is a capsule, so it's going to keep developing and then burst open to release its seeds. And they get smaller and kind of transitional in here to a really tiny developing fruit, and then some still open flowers. Uh, flowers are bilaterally symmetrical, so looking at them from the side, there's a top and a bottom very clearly. Uh, looking at them from the front, it's a pretty common shape in... Uh, sort of plants that are 
in a, a large group of plants related to uh, mints and snapdragons and so on. So what we have here are uh, petals that are fused together and uh, the rough number is, well, I guess you could say five if you want to. Um, kind of, you need to know developmentally where this plant is coming from. It's got like five petals fused together, a couple fused in this up position and then three more fused at the bottom there. And this is a, a nice way to attract animals that are gonna pollinate that and also exclude some of them. So the reproductive parts in here are stashed away. It's a little, it's gonna get hard to get on film here, but um, and there, there's a little glint of yellow, uh, probably a, a stamen pollen color. And I can't quite tell you what's going on in there, but uh, there's a little bit more of the flower that we can't see uh, beyond that opening. And there would be insects that are uh, able to get in there, get the nectar and transfer the pollen for this plant. We've got a plant here that looks a little bit like dandelions, uh, but they are not the same species. They're related, however, so uh, in the very same group of the same family that dandelions are found in. Uh, we'll notice that in the flowers as they're put together. Uh, this is one that is growing in this habitat, kind of in small clumps. Uh, there's one over there. I don't know if you'll be able to make it out. Uh, little clumps here and there, but otherwise pretty occasional, I think I would say, in this habitat. It uh, looks like they're doing all right in places where uh, some groups of seeds have landed. This is one that uh, is not, not particularly rare, or uh, it's actually not even native, so I don't mind taking advantage of this plant here. Uh, you can see that the leaves are uh, basil only. I didn't get this whole plant, but I got a lot of them there. So this, uh, <laughs> mostly basil. There's one leaf coming out along this stem here, uh, but otherwise this stem is heading just to a cluster of uh, flowers there. The leaves are pretty hairy, uh, also sessile, so they taper down to their attachment point. Uh, hairy on the underside and the top side, so adaxial and abaxial sides, uh, venation pinnate, but kind of faintly pinnate venation there, uh, margin a little bit toothed, you'd be forgiven for calling that entire, uh, leaves mostly basil, I guess while we're here there's a little bit of a, an interesting animal associate, uh, this is the spittle bug has done this, so I did not accidentally spit on this plant, as far as I know, uh, it's an insect called a spittle bug and there's its little uh, I'm going to say nymph, and might be wrong on that, uh, living in this spit. So <laughs> just as you might not be inclined to eat a pile of spit that you found on a plant, so are the predators of these insects. Uh, go back in your spit, man. All right, so uh, hairy and also a little bit dotted at the locations where these hairs are uh, all along the stem, and then uh, crowning in a, a flower head, and then a whole bunch of buds of flower heads up at the top of this plant. Uh, this belongs to the sunflower family, which is the same family that we find our dandelions in. And in that group, the uh, parts that look like flowers are actually groups of flowers that we call flower heads. So if you're ever talking about one of these, uh, your temptation is to say, look at that flower. But in fact, this is a whole bunch of flowers. Um, so a couple of uh, bracts on their way to this flowering head, uh, the peduncle here, the flower stalk, still a bunch of hairs all over this, uh, looking, yeah, still a little bit colorful at their bases. And then to get the individual flowers here, uh, you can just sort of dissect this as though it were a flower, and what you'll see coming out are uh, individual flowers. Uh, one way that we know that they're single flowers and not parts of a, a flower, uh, they've got a, a yellow uh, corolla tube there. The fringe there is called a pappus. That's related to the uh, calyx. And then uh, up at the top here, there's a, a two-parted stigma. So uh, having a united, uh, two carpels united with a, a single style, that's something you'd find inside of a flower or not. Uh, definitely distinguishes this as its own flower. So uh, yellow flower tube, 
stigma, the anthers would be inside. The things would be really tiny at this point, so I can't really show you much. One of our graminoids in this habitat that is already flowering uh, is a sedge in here. And uh, there are little units of this species kind of sparsely throughout. I think I'd call this occasional. And uh, so to know that it's a graminoid, we have really small flowers. Come along. Uh, linear, long, linear leaves. So flowers that uh, if you weren't a botanist, you might not even think were flowers. Long linear leaves, uh, long sheaths on those leaves. These are features we find in a lot of our graminoids. And uh, which kind of graminoid are we looking at? Let's see what we can do for telling that. So uh, we can look and kind of make out. Is that working okay? Uh, it's got a little bit of a three ranked thing to it. So one leaf going down, one going upper left, one going upper right. Uh, and that direction of leaves kind of repeats a little bit as we go up. Uh, if I roll this along in my fingers, it's got a faintly triangular feel to it. So we can use our uh, mnemonic sedges, have edges. Uh, another sedge feature is the closed sheaths. So this leaf blade here uh, has a sheath starting about there. And if we look at the far side, we can see that's totally closed up. That little white line across tells us that we've got a closed sheath and it's closed for a lot of the stem where it's clasping. Uh, if I peel this away, I've got to tear the leaf to get it around. So this um, blade plus sheath, this is actually a single leaf that was attached much farther down where I'm holding it with this hand. All right, moving up the plant. Do, do. Get the leaves out of the way, so still triangular here, but now giving way to the uh, flowering portion of this plant. And uh, probably too much for us to be able to get in, but we can see uh, there are little bits of kind of long, yellowish, kind of papery bits. Those are the anthers, uh, and they look like they're kind of late in the process of shedding their pollen. And then there are other parts, these uh, white sprays, oops, sorry. White sprays are coming out of the tips of these little bulbs. Uh, those are the stigmas. So this is making uh, male reproductive structures and female reproductive structures. And uh, it looks like it's already on, on its way to making some fruits. Um, I think we'll probably run out of the limit of our size here, especially when I drop one. See what we can get here. Yep, uh, that's something for a dissection. But there would be a developing uh, keen or nut in here that would be its reproductive structure. All right, I've got one more for us. This is a plant that's pretty abundant throughout. Uh, I would give this a, uh, say, frequent abundance. And this one is a um, plant that's got see, a little tuft. I'm going to take one bit of the tuft there. Uh, quite a few distinguishing features that would help us to identify it. Um, this is a plant that likes to grow on sandy habitats, so we're pretty good finding it there. Uh, sandy habitats in open sun. So we have, uh, starting off, alternate leaves. And the leaves have these really pronounced lobes at the base. Uh, and if you fold them out, they make a shape we call hastate, uh, where the lobes take kind of a right angle and head away from the main axis of the leaf. So this is the upper adaxial surface, uh, lower abaxial surface. Uh, has a little bit kind of a grainy crystalline shine to it. Uh, looks like we have a kind of a second leaf kind of coming out of the bud, the axillary bud associated with that leaf. Here's another one just like that. So this is the stem leaf here and then some uh, leaves that are growing out from the axillary bud. So kind of a, a little bit puzzling as to what's going on here if you didn't know what was going on. So the leaves are still uh, simple, although they're giving this weird many leaves per node kind of impression. Uh, simple leaves with pedicel, uh, petioles, I'm sorry. <coughs> All right, so heading up, still alternate leaved. Uh, along with the leaves, we can see there's some a uh, little bit of papery leftovers here. 
So this is a feature called the Ocrea that helps us to know what family this belongs to. And this particular genus uh, doesn't have the best Ocreas to look at. Um, you kind of see them if you know what you're looking for, and otherwise you might not make them out so much. Uh, here we go into the inflorescence. We branched once, uh, twice, a few branches in here. I'd probably call this a uh, kind of a variation on a, um, uh, <laughs> a panicle. Sorry, lost a word there. Uh, although the flowers are really, they still have, I'm sorry, I'm talking outside of you. Uh, the flowers have pedicels, but they're pretty short, and the flowers are uh, quite a few clustered together. And a lot of them are in different stages of, of development. Uh, here's one that's open, and you can see that we're looking at a whole bunch of stamens in there. So uh, this is one of those groups where the flowers are, are pretty tiny. Um, sometimes you use them to identify plants. Other times you can, you can basically identify the plants without looking at the flowers. And then getting to the top of this inflorescence, we have a lot more flowers open, so still flowering season for them. We're in a new kind of habitat now that is uh, much more shaded. There are some trees overhead. We've got an oak tree there. Uh, a few of the taller trees are pine trees in here. So pretty good coverage all the way up, uh, except for the parts over the trail where I am. Uh, quite a variety of plants, largely oaks. Pines, I uh, saw some elms, hickories. Uh, I'll take a little chance to introduce you to some leaf variation around here. So a new kind of fern in here. This one is uh, fairly abundant. I think I would call it common in this area. So we've got it growing in light gaps and also in some of the uh, darker areas in here quite a bit on either side of the trail. And I'm going to look at this one in here, just kind of compare it to the fern we saw earlier. And uh, go ahead and take off a single frond for us. So again, down to the rhizome. We can take this apart. Uh, see, it's got a little bit of, kind of uh, leaf debris there for uh, some more juvenile parts of the leaf. Uh, sometimes it gives it kind of a fuzzy uh, orange color. To it there. So what are we looking at here? This again, single leaf or frond, uh, definitely divided once, pinnate, and then the second division, if we look at that, uh, not, let's look more carefully. All right, looks like we're all the way divided. So a little bit, sorry, out of camera. Uh, a little bit different from what we saw before with the other fern, but same kind of division. So, um, so the other one was uh, branched into three main parts at the base. This one just has the uh, little more standard kind of feather form of uh, same kinds of leaflets branching off to the side. Each of those leaflets are, uh, again, completely divided. So this is bipinnate. That means in two orders divided. Uh, and then this one, I think you'd call pinnatophid again. So bipinnate, pinnatophid for this one also. Uh, if you remember, the last fern we saw had... Uh, rolled up pieces on the undersides of the leaves where the spores were kept. And this one has uh, much more scattered, uh, but in a nice regular pattern, really attractive feature sometimes you can discover in ferns. Uh, these spore producing clusters on the undersides of leaves, and there's actually a, a characteristic covering on those called an indusium. So the uh, lighter kind of yellow color is a covering over the spore producing regions. And that can be one of the features that helps you to identify this plant. Uh, kind of an interesting thing about ferns is that uh, they can produce spores on their leaves. Uh, not every leaf is spore producing. In this case, we have one with lots of spores on the underside. And this whole plant appears to be going for spores, but we could find another, uh, the same species nearby. <laughs> Forgot to prepare one. Uh, one last check. There we go. So leaves are the same species. This is the underside, the abaxial surface. Uh, no spore structures on here. This is something you sometimes find in uh, more juvenile leaves or um, plants that may not be in a place that's suitable to produce spores. All right, so besides our fern, let's check out some of our leaf variation we have in this region. Uh, lots of different plants, not a lot of them flowering at this moment, but we can check out how the leaves are formed uh, in different ways. So here we've got a, a little shrub with a compound leaf 
divided three times. And at the base, you can see some stipules there. And this one uh, divided three times. The leaflets are pinnately compound, also uh, serrate toothed. Uh, looks like we have even tooths of different orders. So kind of a big tooth uh, interspersed with some little teeth that make up the big teeth. Uh, nice and fuzzy on both sides, or uh, at least on the underside. Fuzzy on the underside for this leaf. Uh, nearby, another plant with compound leaves. This is, uh, we don't have a lot of these. This is one of our uh, palmately compound leaves. So this is one leaf. Uh, here's where it's emerging from a stem. There's a little bit of bud there that tells you where the leaf originated. So petiole and then uh, compound into five leaflets all originating from the same place. So palmately compound leaflets are pinnately veined, uh, toothed very similarly to the one we just saw. Uh, here we go, another leaf that is simple. So we can tell they're uh, simple leaves. You can see the stipules on there that can give away the leaf base. Uh, and then also really tiny in there are some buds that would show us the leaf base. So let me see if I can get one of these complete with stipules. There we go. I got one stipule. So one stipule at the base of this leaf. Uh, kind of an interesting venation pattern. It's pinnate venation, but then the uh, veins kind of arc towards the tip. Uh, they have a special name for this called arcuate venation. The uh, margins are a little bit, they're finely serrate toothed, uh, not entire. All right, moving on. Let's see, what haven't we looked at yet? Here's a little uh, juvenile of a hickory. So hickories typically have more leaflets than this, but this one's got three leaflets on this leaf. Uh, same thing, kind of fat towards the base of that leaf. And then uh, this time compound into three leaflets, wholly divided, each leaflet pinnately veined, serrate toothed margins. Some of the same stuff we've seen before. Uh, another one over here. Coming in at uh, single, simple leaves with a nice example of pinnate venation. This is kind of the textbook pinnate venation where the side veins, the lateral veins go all uh, kind of even with each other toward the margins. Uh, here we have an entire margin and adaxial, adaxial here, abaxial surface, a uh, little bit different. You can just make out the difference in the venation uh, there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, really good time of year to see stipules on some of these plants where the stipules don't last forever. So this is a, uh, one of our trees that's got uh, stipules here. Uh, this is actually the stipules that belong to that leaf because they're located at the place where it leaves the stem. And uh, two stipules, nice fine linear stipules. And again, pinnately veined uh, leaf teeth, serrate of two orders. So uh, the teeth have teeth. Even the teeth have teeth. Uh, I don't know if you can make it out. The leaf is kind of finely hairy on the under uh, abaxial surface. Uh, with my naked eye, I see a little bit of hairiness on the upper abac, sorry, adaxial surface as well. Uh, another one, we saw hickory before. This appears to be one of our um, ashes. So uh, pinnately compound into seven leaflets. They're all pinnately veined. A uh, little bit of kind of obscure rounded teeth toward the tips of those leaflets. Uh, who else we got here? Oh, wonderful. So down here, a uh, plant with some parallel veins that are, uh, the leaves are sessile, so they uh, taper all the way down to the base of the leaf. Uh, a little bit shiny on the upper surface. Whoa, very shiny on the lower surface. Uh, right next to it, another one of a different species. I uh, got one of the stipules with it. So stipules again on this one. Uh, pinnately veined, simple leaves. And the teeth, uh, this is, every leaf that I've shown you so far is a different species. And uh, maybe you can appreciate some of the differences we're noticing. Although I feel like I'm saying a lot of the same thing. So here we have again, serrate teeth of two orders, uh, pinnately veined and stipules present. Uh, but if you took a careful look at a lot of the leaves we're seeing right now, uh, you could notice the differences that uh, 
kind of persistent differences in shape that make them distinct. Uh, another one here also got some stipules. It's stipule season. Uh, this one's got deep lobes, so not compound, but instead lobed. Uh, three main lobes here, then the main margin is deeply serrate toothed, I would say. Uh, this one has main divisions as uh, palmately veined, so a little bit different than we've seen in a lot of leaves in here. Uh, a little bit irregular shape, so asymmetrical, sometimes we see that. Uh, here's some others of the same. Another one of the same kind as that. Uh, a little bit better developed. So underside ab axial, upper side ad axial surface. A uh, little bit hairy to the touch. I don't know if that's coming through on the video. Moving over to one of our trees in the vicinity. Uh, rather large leaves and uh, lobed. So not compound, but lobed. Uh, kind of a, a wavy lobe to these. So one you could easily rip, recreate with a pencil. Um, smooth or entire margins all throughout these lobes. Uh, major venation is pinnate. Uh, we do have a little bit of a technical petiole here, although we do have the blade kind of tapering down to about that point where the blade stops. Uh, one more. This is uh, different from the ash, although this has the common name of prickly ash, so maybe you'd be forgiven uh, for getting those mistaken. This one has uh, actually alternate leaves, which will help distinguish it, but otherwise they're pinnately compound. They're a little bit shiny. Uh, see, they have a smell to them. Yeah, much more uh, aromatic. So this is actually in the citrus family, it gives off kind of a citrusy smell, uh, along with these little bit different kind of looks, uh, looking leaves. Uh, let me see, we had the oaks uh, with the smooth margins. Now we have another one. Uh, this is another of our oak leaves with the uh, lobed, deep, wavy lobes. But big difference here is that these lobes terminate in teeth. And so it's not uh, an entire margin, really a toothed margin on there for the uh, oak leaf there. So underside, upper side. Hi. Hi. Not too often we get to see a flowering tree up close. A lot of times they flower above where we can see. Uh, here's a hickory nice and close to us. Uh, just looking at the leaves, vegetative parts for quick reference. We have uh, pinnately compound leaves with five leaflets. And then buried back in there are some reproductive parts. So these are, uh, this is a plant that has separate male and female flowers in different parts of the inflorescence. So this is a dangly structure called a catkin. Uh, containing a whole bunch of little male flowers. So each of those bead looking things is actually a, a cluster of a couple, a uh, few flowers, uh, all what we'd call male flowers. So flowers that are producing only pollen and not receiving pollen to develop seeds. Uh, and that way the plant can invest more in them. So pollen is a little less expensive and they can make a lot of pollen for giving away. And then at other parts over here, uh, we have the reproductive female flowers, uh, much fewer in number, larger, and uh, devoted to receiving pollen. So a little hard to make out the differences in the parts. Uh, there's a few bracts associated with them. Looks like we got four big bracts on this one. And then those uh, that split into two of uh, the top one, that's the two-parted stigma. So a pretty big surface area for catching pollen. Uh, and as you might know about hickory, this is going to develop into a single seed inside of the hickory nut. So uh, all this flower has to do is receive one successful pollen grain, make it fertilize, and that will develop into the fruit. Uh, there's one, two, there's another female flower below. So uh, relative investment here, there's actually another female flower coming in. Uh, we can just see the stigmas there. Relative investment, we've got three female flowers to... Uh, hundreds of male flowers. So those male flowers just have to give away the pollen. The female flowers will, uh, if they develop into fruits, will have to invest the energy into, into developing seeds. Uh, let's try to look a little more closely at one of these male flowers. Uh, they're in bud yet, so you can see the uh, kind of two-parted, the folded over um, anther. So the male flowers that are uh, wind pollinated like this one is, they don't invest much in being showy and instead they're investing in uh, 
pollen production. So they're pretty much just little globs of anthers uh, full of pollen ready to give that away. So this is all before opening. They're ready to go, uh, ready to give some people allergies as soon as they open up and release their pollen. And a little caterpillar for show there. Possibly also interested in some pollen. We'll see.